A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Welcome to another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. My name is Cam Edwards. I am glad that you joined us on the program today. Coming up in a couple minutes here, we're going to talk about an interesting suggestion on how to push back against the expected onslaught of anti-gun regulations and uh, perhaps legislation uh, in a uh, Biden-Harris administration. We also have our first good deed of the day, our first armed citizen story of of the day. Well, yeah. It is the first of the day, but it's also the first of the year, as well as our first armed citizen story of the year uh, and our first recidivist report as well. Uh, Happy New Year to you. Thank you so much for tuning into the program. I hope that you are prepared to be engaged and involved this year because I think things are, um, I was going to say going to get crazy, but nah, we've been in crazy for months now. I just don't see any uh, end in sight in the near term. Unfortunately, I think 2021 is just going to be as bonkers as 2020 has been, uh, at least for the uh, next several months. Mm, I'm I'm guessing longer than that, quite honestly. I think that uh, we are probably in this for the long term. Uh, But in the meantime, and it's, you know, it's, it's hard because, again, like you really don't know how bonkers banana crazy is it going to get. Uh, in the next couple of days, in the next couple of weeks, in the next couple of months. If it does go completely sideways, then obviously, you know, talk about normal political activity, political involvement kind of falls by the wayside. But uh, I'm I'm going to go on the assumption, and I don't know how wise this is, but for the purposes of today's broadcast, I'm going to go on the assumption that, uh, yes, over the course of 2021, we will still have a functioning Congress. We will still have functioning state legislatures uh, that is crazy bananas as things are. Um, we haven't seen the complete collapse of our institutions in our society. That's the assumption that I'm going on here. I don't don't ask me what the odds of that are at this moment in time, because honestly, I don't know. Uh, but I ran across an interesting piece at the 10th Amendment Center. Uh, entitled, Dear Gun People, Follow the Lead of the Weed People. This is by a guy named uh, Mike Meharry, who is the communications director for the uh, 10th Amendment Center. Uh, and it's a, it's, it's a piece that's worth exploring. Uh, I've got a couple of quotes I want to share with you. And we're just going to kind of go through uh, uh, Mike's column, because I think there are some, there, there's, a, there's an interesting take here. Uh, He says, I know a lot of you are pretty upset about the prospects of a Biden presidency. He's promised to be tough on guns, and you think he might start an all-out assault on the Second Amendment. We could see more federal gun control coming down the pike. We could even see some kind of weapons ban. Now, granted, he says, the Senate may slow uh, slow Biden's role if it remains in Republican control. Uh, But, he says, that's not a sure thing. Uh, And he says, after all, there are quite a few liberal Republican senators who might just go along with more gun control, especially if there's some kind of tragic shooting incident that gets people all riled up about guns again. On top of that, he writes, modern presidents have proven that they don't really need Congress to implement gun control. They can do a lot of damage to the Second Amendment via executive order. All right. I got to say, I I don't see anything uh, wrong with Mike's analysis there. You know, if Republicans are able to keep control of the Senate, then that would mean that uh, Mitch McConnell remains majority leader. Uh, I think it is doubtful that Mitch McConnell would bring gun control to the table, but uh, doubtful is not uh, positive, right? And and I think Matt's right that if Democrats do win both of these Georgia Senate seats on Tuesday and you now have a 50-50 Republican Senate uh, Democrat Senate with Kamala Harris casting the tie-breaking vote, um, <clears throat> you could indeed see Democrats uh, lure a couple of Republicans along on gun control measures. Uh, Senator Pat Toomey, for example, you know, has already backed uh, quote-unquote universal background checks. So is it possible that a couple of other Republicans would go along uh, allowing Democrats to advance some sort of you know gun control agenda, e- even if they only had a 50-50 or maybe a 51-50 majority counting Kamala Harris in the Senate. Uh, It is possible. But as Mike points out, it's also, 
I think, a foregone conclusion that Joe Biden is not going to rely simply on Congress to advance his anti-gun agenda, that he will use executive actions. He will use um, administrative regulatory authority to try to limit our Second Amendment rights. So Mike has a suggestion and a, a potential solution. He talks about uh, how President Trump has not been great on the Second Amendment, you know, back in the bump stock ban. Uh, but he says, anyway, Trump wasn't much of a Second Amendment president. He says, now I'll grant you Biden could be even worse. Uh, I think that's a foregone conclusion. Uh, but it doesn't have to matter, he says, because the weed people have given you the blueprint to stop federal, gov uh, federal gun control in its tracks. He says, actually, the weed people didn't come up with a blueprint. James Madison gave it to us in Federalist 46 when he says that states could impede unwarrantable federal actions or even warrantable actions that happen to be unpopular with a, quote, refusal to cooperate with officers of the union. Matt says this is what marijuana activists have done. Instead of focusing on D.C. politics, they took action at the state and local level, and they've enjoyed great success. Despite federal prohibition, 36 states have legalized marijuana in some form. During the 2020 election, four more states legalized recreational marijuana, bringing the total number to 15. Well, that's true. Again, all of that is, is true. I, I would argue, however, that um, the gun people got there first. <laughs> That's what I would argue. That is actually the weed people that have taken a page from the gun people. But let, let's explore this a little bit further, and I'll tell you my rationale as to why I say that. Um, he writes, did I mention that the federal government continues its efforts at marijuana control? He says, you see, the dirty little secret is that the federal government can't enforce its laws without state and local cooperation. When it comes to weed, state and local governments haven't cooperated. In fact, they have outright defied federal prohibition. When a state legalizes marijuana for medical or recreational use, it removes a layer of laws prohibiting the possession and use of marijuana. This is significant, he writes, because FBI statistics show that law enforcement makes approximately 99 of 100 marijuana arrests under state, not federal law. By legalizing cannabis, these states can essentially sweep away at least some of the basis for 99% of marijuana arrests. Further, figures indicate that it would take 40% of the DEA's yearly budget just to investigate and raid all of the dispensaries in Los Angeles, a single city in a single state. That doesn't include the cost of prosecution. The lesson, he writes, the feds lack the resources to enforce marijuana prohibition without state assistance. And again, he's right. Now, that does not mean that in states like Colorado, for example, that have legalized recreational marijuana, you've got dispensaries that the public can go and visit. You've got grow operations that uh, are licensed by the state. None of that means that the federal government is not still going in and enforcing the drug laws. They are. Um, but it's who they're enforcing the drug laws against. Is the DEA likely to bust somebody who's got you know a dime bag on them walking down the street of Denver? No. Um, are they likely to investigate these large grow houses to see if any of the uh, cannabis that's being grown there is being diverted to the black market? Yes. Are they likely to go after these grow houses if they don't have all of their permits and ducks in a row? Yes. Uh, are they still pulling over people, uh, you know, driving down the road who they think uh, are suspicious? Yes. There was a case last year, I believe a couple, I think this couple was from Pennsylvania. And they were busted driving back from Colorado with, um, I don't remember how many pounds it was, but I mean, it was, it was pounds. This was an elderly couple. Their son actually was a state legislator uh, in Pennsylvania. And, uh, you know, th these folks were pulled over. They were arrested. They were charged. So these crimes are still being prosecuted uh, at the federal level. And yes, even state officials are enforcing state level drug laws. But Matt is correct when he talks about the actions that states have uh, uh, undertaken uh, to legalize cannabis at the state level and what that means in terms of federal prosecution. It doesn't end it entirely. But uh, Matt is correct in saying that the federal government, uh, you know, for the most part, relies on state and local law enforcement to make these arrests and then cases will get, you know, referred up to the U.S. attorney. Again, if there's a DEA investigation or, or, or some sort of federal investigation, obviously that's different. 
But Matt says those aren't the majority of the arrests that we're talking about. Now, he uh, concludes his piece by writing, the feds would almost certainly have the same problem maintaining any federal gun control scheme if state simply stopped enforcing it. But for whatever reason, he says, you all don't seem to want to press that option. You gun folks would rather send money to the feckless NRA or elect a Second Amendment president like Trump who ends up awful on the Second Amendment or beg federal judges to protect their rights. Newsflash, he writes, that isn't working. What I'm trying to tell you is to follow the lead of the weed people. Show some guts like the weed people. Get out there and nullify like the weed people. Because when it's all said and done, that's the only way that you're going to stop the erosion of the Second Amendment. The federal government isn't ever going to limit the federal government. You have the blueprint. Now get busy and start building, he says. So a couple of things. I would argue that the Second Amendment sanctuary movement, which dates back to at least 2018, um, goes a long way towards what Matt is talking about. You know, these Second Amendment sanctuary resolutions that have been offered, and in some cases, Second Amendment sanctuary ordinances that have been uh, offered and approved uh, at both the you know county level, at the local level, uh, state of Oklahoma, actually, there's a lawmaker who's uh, introduced a bill this year that would declare oh, at least the entire state of Oklahoma a Second Amendment sanctuary, doing exactly what Matt is recommending. Most of the, you know, the, the, the language of those individual resolutions and ordinances that can vary from county to county or from uh, city to city. But generally speaking, one of the things that these resolutions or ordinances state is that local funds will not be used to enforce unconstitutional federal gun control laws. So that is, I think, what Matt is talking about, where you've got, uh, you know, again, that that pushback from the local level saying, look, you can pass whatever law you want, but that doesn't mean that we're going to lift a finger to enforce it. And by the way, that 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 didn't start with the weed people either. OK, you can go back 100 years to the advent of prohibition in the United States. And while prohibition made the sale uh, or the possession of most alcohol illegal at the federal level, you had a number of states, you had a number of cities within those states that said, nah, we're, we're, I mean, if that's the law, that's, that's the law, but you guys go ahead and enforce it because we've got bigger things to do. Especially over the course of Prohibition's 10-year history, you saw more and more localities adopt that attitude. Now, many of them had their own local dry laws on the books, but those that did not, again, left it up to the federal government, the Prohibition agents, to go in and, all right, you enforce the Prohibition laws. You're the ones who put them on the books, so they're your laws to enforce. This idea is not new. I would also argue, however, that there is a difference between what Matt's talking about in terms of states legalizing the possession of marijuana or legalizing, you know, uh, cannabis recreationally and our Second Amendment rights. Because the vast majority of state constitutions in this country already protect our right to keep and bear arms. I'm not aware of any state constitution that explicitly states, hey, you can use marijuana. That, that, that's your right. The vast majority of state constitutions, on the other hand, do explicitly protect the right of the people to keep and bear arms. And as states have been added to the union over the course of the last, you know, 240 some odd years, those states have typically, when they've passed their own constitution, included a right to keep and bear arms. You go back to 1776, North Carolina, the very first state constitution, when North Carolina became a state as opposed to a, a colony of Great Britain. This is what the 1776 North Carolina constitution said. That the people have a right to bear arms for the defense of the state. And as standing armies in time of peace are dangerous to liberty, they ought not to be kept up. And that the military should be kept under strict subordination to and governed by the civil power. Pennsylvania. 1776, that the people have a right to bear arms for the defense of themselves and the state. And as standing armies in a time of peace or dangerous to liberty, they ought not to be kept up. And that the military should be kept under strict subordination to and governed by the civil power. 
Very similar to North Carolina's, except that Pennsylvania's explicitly included the right of the people to bear arms for defense of themselves as well as for the state. Vermont, 1777. Adopting Pennsylvania's language, that the people have a right to bear arms for the defense of themselves and the state. 1792, Kentucky, that the right of these citizens to bear arms in defense of themselves and the state shall not be questioned. Maine, 1819, every citizen has the right to keep and bear arms for the common defense, and this right shall never be questioned. Michigan, 1835, every person has a right to bear arms for the defense of himself and the state. Oregon, 1857, that the people shall have the right to bear arms for the defense of themselves and the state, but that the military shall be kept in strict subordination to the civil power. Uh, Post-Civil War era. Georgia, 1868. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free people, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, but the General Assembly shall have the power to prescribe by law the manner in which arms may be born. Yeah. Uh, Mississippi, 1868. All persons shall have a right to keep and bear arms for their defense. Colorado, 1876, the right of no person to keep and bear arms in defense of his home, person, and property, or in aid of the civil power, when thereto legally summoned, shall be called into question. But nothing herein shall be construed to justify the practice of carrying concealed weapons. You can see, by the way, how the language changes a little bit over the course of the decades, right? By the time the 1860s, 1870s roll around, now pistols are much more common, uh, they are easily concealed. And the uh, conventional wisdom at the time was, all right, well, if you're concealing your gun, it means you're up to no good. So if you want to walk around with your uh, gun, carry it openly. So we all can see what's going on. Obviously, that's changed now. Now the conventional wisdom is, all right, well, if you're carrying a gun, we don't, you know, people get freaked out if they see uh, an openly carried firearm. So carry your firearm concealed and you're good to go. That's Again, I'm not saying that's the way it should be. That's what's right or what's wrong. I'm saying that's what the conventional wisdom is. But even when those state constitutions in the post-Civil War era were explicitly talking about, uh, you know, the legislature has the right to regulate the manner of carrying, they didn't say the legislature has the right to ban the carrying of firearms. They said, you know, we can tell you you got to carry it openly or you got to carry it concealed or you got to do one or the other. But they did not assume the power to bar people from bearing arms in self-defense. Uh, So we keep going here. Uh, 1907, Oklahoma. The right of a citizen to keep and bear arms in defense of his home, person, or property, or in aid of the civil power when thereto legally summoned shall never be prohibited. But nothing herein shall prevent the legislature from regulating, again, regulating, the carrying of weapons. Uh, New Mexico, 1912. People have the right to bear arms for their security and defense, but nothing herein shall be held to permit the carrying of concealed weapons. By the way, the, the, the New Mexico state constitution was revised Uh, decades later, to more explicitly protect the right to keep and bear arms. Uh, Michigan, Constitutional Amendment 1963, every person has a right to keep and bear arms for the defense of himself and the state. Uh, 1971, New Mexico's uh, amendment, no law shall abridge the right of the citizen to keep and bear arms for security and defense, for lawful hunting and recreational use, and for other lawful purposes. But nothing herein shall be held to permit the carrying of concealed weapons. Again, Uh, 1978, Idaho. Again, now we're getting into the constitutional amendments, right? So these are states, obviously, that are already in the union, but now you've got lawmakers who are going back and uh, revising the state constitution. So Idaho, 1978, the people have the right to keep and bear arms, which right shall not be abridged. But this provision shall not prevent the passage of laws to govern the carrying of weapons concealed on the person, nor prevent passage of legislation providing minimum sentences for crimes committed while in the possession of a firearm, nor prevent the passage of legislation providing penalties for the possession of firearms by a convicted felon, nor prevent the passage of any legislation punishing the use of a firearm. No law shall impose licensure, registration, or special taxation on the ownership or possession of firearms or ammunition, nor shall any law permit the confiscation of firearms except those actually used in the commission of a felony. Uh, The most recent addition to state constitutions in terms of the right to keep and bear arms, Wisconsin, uh, 1998, that the people have the right to keep and bear arms for security, defense, hunting, recreation, or any other lawful purpose. So I would argue that, that we already have the physical skeleton in place in terms of those state level protections on the second amendment because the the you know let's just say apocalyptic scenario right 
Uh, Biden packs the court. They, they nuke the legislative filibuster. Democrats ram through legislation that says the Second Amendment is hereby repealed. And you have no right to keep in your arms under the federal constitution. And the, you know, anti-gun packed Supreme Court says, yeah, yeah, that looks fine to us. Even then, without any sort of federal protection for our right to keep and bear arms, most states have those protections written into the Constitution. So even if the right to keep and bear arms were not protected at the federal level, they would be protected at the state level. Now, let's say apocalyptic scenario number two. Now you've got uh, an anti-gun pack Supreme Court. Now you've got, you know, the Democrats, they've nuked the filibuster. They're passing legislation with 51 votes. So not only do they pass a bill that says the Second Amendment is hereby repealed, which, by the way, you can't even do during leg- with legislation. You would actually have to amend the Constitution in order to do that. So you need a three-quarters vote in uh, both chambers of the Congress, and then you'd have to have, what is it, three-quarters of a vote? Two-thirds vote in Congress. Three-quarters of the states would have to ratify that. So I don't think that's going to happen. But even if they were to, again, let's just assume something crazy happens and they do that, unless they also specifically passed a a constitutional amendment that not just erased the Second Amendment from the Bill of Rights, but then further stated, and oh yeah, by the way, not only do you not have the right to keep and bear arms, we're actually criminalizing the possession of all firearms outside of the military and law enforcement. Again, you'd have to do that through a constitutional amendment. I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think the votes are there. But then and only then would you have a conflict between these state constitutional protections and the federal government saying, you don't have a right to own a gun. So we're a ways away from that, I think. Knock on wood. But in the meantime, The idea of states sending that message. I mean, again, it's not that states can't legalize gun ownership. They already have. Right. So it's not like you you can't in Virginia, for example, last year, uh, the state legislature decriminalized uh, the possession of marijuana. I believe it's under I think it's like under two ounces. Now it's a fine. It's not legal, but it's 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 like a twenty five dollar fine or something like that. Excuse me. So there is no real corollary to take the same type of action to protect the Second Amendment in Virginia. We've got an anti-gun governor. We've got anti-gun lawmakers. We just passed a half dozen gun control measures watered down, but they still pass. But it's not like we could pass some sort of legislation in Virginia that would say, hey, uh, owning a gun is legal. Because it is. It already is. Right? So this suggestion by um, the uh, gentleman at the uh, 10th Amendment Center, uh, Matt Mahari, is it's not a bad idea, but it's not going to work the way it worked with legalizing weed because guns are a legal product. Firearm ownership is protected by the Constitution whereas the Constitution is silent when it comes to the legalization of weed. Now, I happen to think that the Second Amendment Sanctuary Movement is a a good one, and one that I I, I suspect we will see um, another surge in support for the Second Amendment Sanctuaries over the course of 2021. And I would not be surprised... I, you know, in Oklahoma, that's one of the most pro-gun states out there. There, there might be some lawmakers this year like, mm, I don't know if we really want to get into this. If we really want to declare the state a Second Amendment sanctuary. I mean, boy, aren't that just going too far? I, I understand that impulse. And I would say, no, it's, it's really not going too far. Worst case scenario, it never comes into play. You, you, you pass this provision saying, look, we're not going to use state dollars or local taxpayer dollars to enforce these unconstitutional federal gun control laws. If, if that happens and no new federal gun control laws come down the pike, well, then it's a moot, you know, a, a piece of legislation. Doesn't really matter one way or the other. If, on the other hand, you do see the Biden administration try to impose unconstitutional restrictions on a right to keep and bear arms, 
Well, the state has the power to decide where their law enforcement funds are going to be spent. And if they don't want to spend their resources, their finite resources, enforcing federal gun control, they want to leave that up and set up to the federal authorities. That is a state's prerogative, just as it is a county's prerogative or a county sheriff's prerogative to decide what their priorities are going to be for enforcement. And yes, those county sheriffs have discretion in terms of the laws that they're going to enforce. We've already seen this argued in places like New Mexico uh, and Virginia by county sheriffs who say, you know, you can pass these laws, but I mean, it's just not going to be a priority for my department. We're worried about people breaking into people's homes and home invasions and things like that. We're not worried about trying to go out and investigate every, you know, private transfer of a firearm or uh, somebody possessing a twin round magazine when they're only supposed to have a 10 round magazine. That's not something that we're going to see as a, as a uh, enforcement priority. That's fine. There's, there's, there's nothing legally questionable about that. In fact, Again, that, it's not just the weed people that are doing that or the gun people that are doing that. You got folks on the left who are doing the same thing when it comes to illegal immigration. We're not going to spend any city resources. We're not going to spend any county resources uh, to help enforce uh, federal immigration law. We're not going to cooperate with ICE. We're not going to let ICE know when somebody's getting released from the jail, even though there's an ICE detainer. We're not going to pick up the phone and call ICE and tell them, hey, this person's, you know, be released from our custody if you want to take them in because you need to deport them. We're not going to lift a finger to help. The courts have said that's fine. So why would it also not be fine when it comes to dealing with our right to keep and bear arms? Again, it's not, it's not a perfect corollary to what the weed people have done. And I would, again, argue that the gun people got there first. Going back to 1776, I think the gun people have gotten there first. Uh, but the idea of using other layers of government to push back against unconstitutional gun control measures, that idea, I think, is spot on. And that idea, I think, is going to have a lot of legs in 2021. All right, now let's turn our attention to our armed citizen story, our good deed of the day, our recidivist report. We will uh, start there. Uh, with a, a tragic story out of Florida where a, a brother and sister uh, killed in a, a crash involving a carjacker on a, a Florida highway. 21-year-old Dominic Mills and 18-year-old Danica Mills were on their way back home to Wisconsin after uh, taking in a, a Christmas lights display at the Daytona International Speedway when their vehicle was struck uh, by an individual who was being uh, chased by police. The other driver had a revoked license, uh, apparently was a suspect in a carjacking. Police were chasing him at the time of the crash in a pursuit that at times exceeded 125 miles an hour. Uh, and according to local sheriff uh, there in the area, uh, the uh, individual uh, who was leading police on this chase um known to authorities. He has not been publicly identified, uh, or at least uh, is not uh, as of the time of this broadcast, but uh, the local sheriff there said that the uh, suspect quote had a lengthy criminal history and was shocked that he was not in jail at the time of the crash. He said, quote, he murdered two people. These kids were murdered. It's no different than if he took a gun and put it to their heads, what he did to those kids. Now, in addition to the death of uh, Dominic and Danica, their 13-year-old brother, Drake, I was in the back of the SUV, suffered serious injuries, including fractured ribs, bruised lungs. 17-year-old uh, cousin, Kyle Larson, was also in that SUV when it was struck. He suffered serious injuries, taken to a, a local hospital. Uh, and a, uh, a Kylie Larson, excuse me, not Kyle Larson, Kylie Larson. Uh, GoFundMe has been set up to help with her medical expenses, all four wearing seatbelts. Uh, again, just a, a an incredibly tragic uh, situation, but one that it sounds like could have been prevented. When this 47-year-old man driving a stolen vehicle out of Orange County, Florida, made that U-turn on the interstate, started going in the wrong direction down I-95, and crashed into that SUV with the uh, four individuals inside. The uh, man from Orlando, that suspect, yeah, he uh, was also killed uh, in the crash. So he's not facing any charges. No chance of justice being done here. Just a, uh, again, a tragedy. 
that this family is going to be uh, coping with uh, for the rest of their lives. Now, today's Armed Citizen story from Chicago, Illinois, where carjackings, by the way, are through the roof in 2020. Almost a 100% increase in the number of reported carjackings, one of the latest in the new year, involved an off-duty Chicago police officer who was the attempted victim of a uh, carjacking on the city's west side. This was Friday afternoon. Uh, It happened in the 1300 block of South Kedvale Avenue in the Lawndale neighborhood. Uh, The off-duty officer reportedly shot the man who he says was trying to steal his car. Uh, The suspect's sister, Aisha Brown, said the police just opened fire on him. And she said, my brother got to run, and who's going to stand there while the police are shooting at you? She said, I'm just trying to figure out, like, how are they going to try to clean that thing up, try to make it seem like a carjacking? That man, she says, ain't never carjacked nobody in his life. Well, I guess we'll wait and see. The uh, suspect shot in the arm, taken to a local hospital, last and reported in a fair condition. Two other suspects taken into custody from the uh, incident. Uh, according to the Chicago Police Department, as I mentioned, in 2020, there were 1,362 vehicular hijackings in the city of Chicago compared to 663 vehicular hijackings in 2019. So already in 2019, the city of Chicago was dealing with two carjackings, almost two carjackings a day on average. Now, I mean, that number has, again, it's almost doubled. 1,362 carjackings, multiple carjackings every single day in the city of Chicago. And by the way, if those numbers concerned you, let's say you're a Chicago resident and you're a little freaked out by that, so you decide, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy a gun. I'm going to get my concealed carry license so I can, I can carry. Good luck with that. Good luck with that. Because if you're not a gun owner, first got to get your firearms owner ID card in, uh, in the state of Illinois. And right now there's about a, about a 140,000 name backlog. So it's taking, on average, more than 140 days for the state police to process the FOIA card applications. Then once you receive your government permission slip to purchase a firearm, then you've got to go through the training. You've got to get your concealed carry license. And yeah, There's about a 20,000 person backlog for concealed carry applications in the state of Illinois right now. So if you saw those numbers in Chicago today and you're like, man, this is freaking ridiculous. I want to be able to protect myself. The state won't allow you to. Now, right away, you're going to have to twiddle your thumbs. Who knows how long? Maybe four months, maybe five, maybe six. I don't know. They'll try to get to it as soon as they can. But in the meantime, your rights are being denied to you at a time when crime is out of control. Now, the Illinois State Rifle Association has a lawsuit, one of many lawsuits pending in the state of Illinois. Uh, They've got a court hearing coming up. I believe it's January 15th, asking for an injunction to, uh, to do something to get the state police to start processing these FOIA applications in a timely manner. We'll keep you up to date uh, on uh, those uh, activities as we get closer. Finally today, our good deed of the day from Massachusetts, where an off-duty officer in the right place at the right time to save an 11-year-old from being mauled by a dog. This was um, last Wednesday afternoon in uh, Dorchester, Massachusetts. An off-duty officer lives nearby, um, heard what was going on. He actually jumped several fences to get to the victim after hearing the screams, and he fired at least one shot to get the dog to stop attacking the child. Uh, Boston Police Commissioner William Gross says, thank God the officer was there to intervene because if he didn't, the dog was going to continue to attack the child. There was also another pit bull being restrained by an individual that I'm confident would have joined in on the attack as well. The 11-year-old is expected to survive, did have injuries to his neck, arm, and groin. Uh, In a handwritten letter the victim's family wrote, the Rodriguez Rojas family is grateful to the police hero who rescued our son, Bramwell. My heart is grateful that all of the police officers have done a great job. Well, in the right place at the right time, we'll unable to do the right thing. I hate to see those stories about the uh, dog attacks. I always wonder again, like, you know, what what led up to that? Not, Not blaming the kid, but... Definitely some questions for the owner there, but uh, I am glad to see that the 11-year-old is okay. Thanks again to the quick thinking and uh, quick actions of that off-duty officer there in Boston, Massachusetts. Now, that is all the time we've got for you on this edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. 
Probably went into extra time for this one, actually, but that's all right. Uh, Have a great rest of your Monday. Glad that you're back with us. We'll be back tomorrow with more of the latest Second Amendment news and information from all across the nation. But in the meantime, don't forget, you can subscribe to Town Hall Media on YouTube. That way you'll never miss a program. Bearing Arms, Cam & Company on Rumble, as well as Amazon Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, Stitcher. Try to make it very easy for you to find the show each and every day. We certainly do appreciate your support. We'll see you tomorrow, but until then, be well. Be safe and be free.